Thank you. Thank you, Zoe. Um, okay, uh, good afternoon. Um, yeah, I think the Jordi has done a very good presentation. Uh, I put this as a second slide because I, I thought that no one would listen to it. Statistically, no one listens to the second slide. But uh, basically, the important part here is that uh, I did the PhD in Lleida and then I um, I was in Sweden it's because the, most of the things I will present today is research I've done in Sweden. So then you, you see that. Um, I also have to mention that now we have a small group in, in Lleida and I'm quite happy that we are growing. So we are uh, four people now uh, without including me, so it's five. And uh, well, we still haven't got a name, but uh, um, I keep putting this label in everything that belongs to us and it's called Microbiolings Lab. So maybe that will be the name that will stick. But so, yeah, but, yeah you can see it here in some of the machines that we have. So, yeah, that's what we do. But basically what we do is to we do metabar coding of uh, plant, soil and water samples. And this is a tool that we apply in different type of uh, projects, like doing sport trapping or um, environmental sampling or even things like tree microbiome. So we have different projects on that. And w two of the lines that I would like to develop here in, in Lleida is working on plant soil feedbacks, something that I started in Sweden. And also then in the interaction with uh, drought and pathogens, which uh, we started the project with Lucia and Jordi, and we still have some research on, on that. So, but uh, okay, today I'm not going to talk in none of those two projects. So I'm going to talk about things that uh, sort of I did in, in, as I mentioned, when I was in Sweden. So, um, so this is a seminar, and I should. Uh, I think one of the challenges when, when I notice when you give a seminar is that um, try to gather everybody, so you carry everybody until the end of the seminar. And I think one of the problems is that you deliver a lot of new words. So if you any of the terms I use, uh, you don't understand, you can interrupt me. But I will start from very basic things. So um, if, if, why is important forest pathology? So uh, I think if we look at the trees or plants, uh, they are full of microbes. So they are, there's a lot of microbes. Of, and this, the reason they are full is because they are quite happy together, or at least they are happy enough to, to withstand. And, and this is because they have had this long uh, history of coevolution. Even the ancestors of these microbes, they coevolved with the ancestors of the host. So, what happens nowadays, and so if that would be the case, we would have little job, I think, the forest pathologists. But nowadays we are doing some changes in the world. And one of the, there are two major changes, I would say, and that put pressure on these coevolutionary interactions. One of them is that uh, the globalization is bringing on new members in this community of microbes, and this the host cannot recognize or it overreacts to, the, to these newcomers. And or uh, there are some changes in the environment that sort of this coevolution happened in a certain environment and this environment is changing. So now the, this happy relationship is not so happy anymore and so this causes some imbalances. So today my talk will basically work on the orange arrows and we will talk about things that have been coming from outside. And this is a problem at EU level. And, and there's a big concern on that, and you can see there's been an in exponential increase in new arrivals of pathogens. And this is, um, we know some facts, and that the, most of these pathogens come uh, in living plants. And, and basically, uh, it's because there's a quite of a trade industry that uh, grows things elsewhere and brings them here. And one of the, the how to say, the, the problems in this uh, system is that, uh, of course, you cannot bring sick plants into Europe. No, no, no one wants that. But the inspections are done often in the nurseries, but they are based on symptoms. The thing is, in nurseries, the plants are very happy, and also they are often uh, apply uh, fungicides, so they are uh, suppressing the disease. So the pathogen is there, but you don't see the symptom. And that causes that when we go to, to our houses and we put this beautiful plant that we bought, then it starts dying. Okay, so this is the, it's a bit not so perfect, the, the system. What happens with the European Union? The European Union has to do something about that. And what to do? It's a problem if you start putting strong regulations on the imports, those same regulations, you have to put them in the trade within the European Union. Otherwise, you would be sort of 
uh, giving a disadvantage. So it's always a balance and so just to put your a bit in perspective the balance is this one so uh, European Union has some conventions in the the convention of biological diversity and the international plant protection convention that has to protect plants and ecosystems but also has some agreements in the World Trade Organization that has to protect the trade so to because this gives economic growth and so the, the, in this balance uh, European Union is interested in knowing what are the pathways that are bringing plants. So these are things that can be regulated. So what, what are the dangerous commodities? What are quarantine species? What, you know, what these kind of terms. And for that, it has a consulting uh, organism, which is called EPO, which is full of uh, plant pathologists and forest pathologists. The problem is that these kind of uh, questions, if you would study forest pathology some years ago, this, we don't do these kind of things. We don't define quarantine species or uh, dangerous pathways. We look more at the interaction and what the conditions favor disease and this kind of thing. So there's been a shift in forest pathology where we start being, becoming more interested in invasion biology. And the reason is because invasion biology is actually interested in this process of introduction. So invasion biology people work with questions such as what is the process of a, a pathogen or an organism intru get introduced into a new system, what is the barrier that has to cross, and these barriers are connected with some terms. So if you reach that stage, you are that. If you reach further on, you are another thing. So, and also it's connected with some management. And actually this uh, discipline of invasion biology has some golden questions, which I thought is quite funny. So, and the golden questions are which species invade, what ecosystem become invaded, invaded and why, how can we manage these invasions, and if you look at these questions, those are exactly the same questions that the European Union is interested in, basically. So they are very applied on the management. So, that's why uh, sort of this been, so that we shifted to this invasion biology in a way. But, uh, of course, this, this uh, invasion biology, most of it was defined in in animal and plants and big organisms and it has some problems when we deal with microbes. One of the main problems for example is that uh, we don't know what is native or not because we hardly know what are the microbes present here and also the, what is a species. I think this is a big problem. If you look at the species a definition, a group of living organisms, similar individuals exchanging genes and interbreeding. Uh, many microbes can interbreed between themselves but doesn't mean that they are actually doing it in nature. So you have uh, but this is very much uh, sort of thinking on big organisms. So then, so there's a, a lot of work in, in this, uh, applying these concepts in forest pathology, and that's what uh, we try to do in this thesis. And I think this is, some of you in the audience know him. This is uh, Miguel Angel, who was, uh, uh, was main supervisor of his thesis, and I'm very proud uh, of him. He, he did a very good job. And we try to use Phytophthora as a model invader. Why Phytophthora? Because everybody is interested in Phytophthora. Phytophthora is a, is a path, there are many big invasions around the world. It invades things from Australia to uh, West States, even in Sweden you have older killed by Phytophthora. So, and also here, if you heard the second Anthena is the same kind of pathway. So you, is this global community interested in this? And it's also a good model because it has not so many species, which doesn't happen very often in microbes. You, you look at soil fungal pathogens has like thousands, but this is has quite of a narrow uh, range. It has some traits, they are quite well annotated, these species. And an important thing is that it's quite easy to monitor. One of the hard thing with microbes is that you cannot see them, of course, in the, in the definition. But this one, Phytophthora, when infects the roots, sort of it produces some sexual spores called oo spores that we will I will tell you later all that but basically those spores they germinate and they produce something called zoo spores and these zoo spores are swimming spores and they like uh, they swim in the water uh, so often these uh, pathogens are sort of washed out in the rivers so rivers can be used to monitor this pathogen okay and before we start with the research that another thing I have to mention is that there are two ecotypes so if we go to the river this Phytophthora is not a fungus, it's a bit related to algae, so it likes a lot the water. So we will find in the river two types of Phytophthora. The, the ones that actually live in the water, and the ones that they come from land and they are washed out into the water. So you have these two types. 
enough of uh, mycology for now. Now we start with the research. But so you remember that we have these two. I will, I will, I will mention it later. So basically, we had a very humble uh, goal in this thesis, uh, which was a bit to uh, define which species were invasive, which turned out not to be so easy. Again, what I mentioned before, definitions are easy with bigger organisms, but not so easy with microbes. So we wanted to see what were the main pathways of this introduction. And then a bit of whether climate or functional change would sort of explain the distribution and also how could we uh, react or what can we do if then we have an invasion. So that was a bit the big question. So we had this first article in which we said, okay, let's go there and see what it is and see if we can define something as invasive. The first thing we did was to take this invasion biology framework and adapt it a little bit to Phytophthora. So we had the nurseries and the forest, and then we divided forests in two types, which were a bit diffuse, but so very natural forests or anthropogenic forests, meaning that's forests that are around the cities or gardens or, you know, with a lot of human influence. So basically that's the framework, that's what we did. And uh, we did a survey based on this framework, on these sort of stages, we did a, a uh, survey. And what we did is we went to the rivers, I explained you before is a good way to find place to have phyt Phytophthora, and we, we measured in river sites that were go in an uh, urban area, in an agricultural area, or in forest area. And then we also did uh, a very directional survey in which we went to nurseries, to anthropogenic forests, and to natural forests, and to look for Phytophthora there. Okay, fine, so we hope to, to see some patterns. I just have to mention something before, is that how do we go and see Phytophthora? I think this is also important but you hardly ever find something like that. That would be a very beautiful canker. Sorry for the beautiful, but I think it's beautiful and, uh, and, uh, and for Phytophthora, but it doesn't mean that none of those trees are infected. So this is because these species can cause cankers on the trunk, but not all of them can do it. A lot of them just kill the roots. So from here it's easy to isolate it. But what we often do is something called soil baiting. So we go under trees and we dig up the roots and a bit of soil and then we put soil and we cover it with water and then we put some leaves on top of the water. So what happens with this soil if it has Phytophthora, the spores will germinate and they will swim to the leaves, right? So after two days we will start seeing these type of spots. So those are the way of fishing the Phytophthora, right? So you can see here. And believe it or not, people that they are good, like Miguel Ángel, they will tell you, this is Phytophthora, but this is not. Because, of course, you know, <laughs> this all has to end up in petri dishes, and, and, but I'm, I'm not that good. So this is, uh, anyway, so this is the, we can do it in, with soil, or we can also do it directly into the river. So we can put these floating rafts, and the leaves, uh, fresh leaves are put, and then the, this, this thing fishes the Phytophthora, and we put them in the petri dishes. That's what we did in these rivers and, uh, and these uh, nurseries, and that's what we got. And that was our first attempt to define what was invasive. So you can see some species in nurseries, some species in anthropogenic forests, and some species in natural. So there seemed to be some species that managed to make it to the end, or not, but at least it would fit in this picture. And so we decided to define those, or say perhaps those are the invasive uh, species and the other ones are perhaps introduced or naturalized but not yet invasive. When we did a uh, principal component analysis we could see that these species tended to occur together suggesting perhaps that they were uh, well, coming in a common pathway and actually when we were looking in rivers that was one was the isolation and this was in rivers as a validation of our thoughts we could see that indeed those three species were very often found in urban areas a little bit less in agriculture and much less in forest systems so, so supporting a bit our idea of that is the pathway of introduction one of the okay that was the first thing we did and i said okay that's very interesting but as you can see there's also uh, to me what is, is quite cool is to understand what happens with these species that don't make it into there because that there must be a process there of filtering <coughs> i must say that we tested this sort of loss of species controlling for many things because one could argue okay here you have more many more hosts in the nursery that you have in the forest so perhaps it's a host no, it's the same loss of species, maybe it's the time of arrival, maybe here the species are still sort of establishing and then you haven't yet seen them in the forest because it takes some time. No, it, 
So there seemed to be a consistent pattern of a loss of species. So we wanted to test whether there was a sort of environmental filter in this. If you are in Sweden and you think about environmental filters, the first thing you will notice is very cold. So that was our first uh, goal and say, okay, maybe cold is making something about that. And that's what we did in, uh, and before starting a big project, we did it a little bit narrow. So we said, okay, let's try with, uh, instead of testing all species, let's try with two species. And I'm sorry, this is like all these new terms and new. So here we talk about two species and why are these good species? Look, this is a X, I mean, this is an, uh, an hybrid. This is one of the parent species, so we have two. They both kill older, and older is growing all over Sweden, more or less. Well, not in the very north. So we have a host that is called over, and then we have uh, two species. One is hybrid. The good thing is that the hybrid is sensitive to low, to low temperatures. It's a sex exploit hybrid, so it cannot produce the sexual spores. And this is like when you get a bit sleepy now, but the sexual spores are the ones that they are very thick walled in phytophthora and they are the ones to resist, uh, survive when the conditions are very high. So these species cannot produce the sexual spores and cannot survive and to, has to reproduce sexually, uh, sexually all the time. So you have one species that is sensitive to cold and one that is not. Perfect system to test our hypothesis. We went to the forest and checked it and indeed we saw that the hybrid was concentrated mainly on the warmer areas of the, of, the, of the country. You can see the distribution is basically in areas that they barely go below zero during, Feb during February, which is the, the coldest month. While the cold tolerant, it would spread quite much northward in areas that they are much colder. So looking at, okay, maybe cold is, uh, is, is something that has uh, something to do. And actually this is quite of a good example of environmental filtering because this one, the cold sensitive, is more aggressive. It's more aggressive than the cold uh, resistant. So in, in theory, if this, you know, one could say, okay, maybe this is better than the other one. So there's a bit of competitive exclusion, but it's not. Because that one should have a higher fitness. So there should be a reason why this one is not replacing the other in this area. Because this one is more aggressive, it should be more pathogenic. Okay, so this, is, this was quite a, of a good result. We could see that cold, and of course here we can start thinking what happens if conditions get warmer and all this stuff. We're seeing that in one species, some other people have mentioned it in other species. We thought, okay, why not looking at community level then? Why not looking at the whole community? Is, is climate really structuring these communities? And that's what we did in one of the last papers of, uh, of Miguel Angel's thesis. And here we use the same sampling, but instead of uh, spending hours and hours isolating and baiting, and, and we just went for the DNA. So when we take water, we filter it, and we used, uh, we designed some high throughput sequencing setup that we could describe all the species in the water. The noble thing in this work was instead of using Illumina MySec with this the short ITS one, we managed to use PacBio. We designed new markers. We could use the full ITS as a marker gene. And as you can see, we got a 9 plus 27, 36 species versus doing it at the same time and in the same plot, 12 species just by baiting. So we increased the amount of species a lot and much less work. So what happened with this? What was the first thing we saw? The, I remember talking to Miguel and he said, like, there's really not a clear pattern here. I don't see anything with the climate. And, but when we were discussing, we said, like, but if I take out the aquatic ones, then it looks very nice. But if I take out the terrestrial, so, okay, then we said, okay, maybe, maybe they're responding differently to the climate, these two species. So when we look at diversity, like uh, all the diversity indices, we could see that terrestrial species would respond a lot to precipitation, so areas with more precipitation would have more species, but um, aquatic species would respond more to temperature. And, and then after seeing that, we said, okay, obvious, if they are in the water, and rivers in Sweden, they have always water, they will not be so, you know, um, they will not care so much about precipitation. Also, interestingly, uh, these aquatic species seem to be responding to land use and to water chemistry because it's actually where do they live. While for these species would not respond to the land use and water chemistry because for them, possibly, the water is more of a dead end. They are just washed out there, these spores. They don't complete the cycle. 
Okay, that's what we, that was our first finding. We said, okay, depending if you are aquatic or terrestrial, this will be influencing you. So then what, uh, you know, we were measuring in other areas. This was above the polar circle. This is, is really beautiful in, in, in north of Sweden and you have these big rivers and we were baiting also there and we found Phytophthora. And, and what I was thinking if it would be a Phytophthora, I would think, okay, there is plenty of water but could be a bit warmer. I myself have said that too, so it, you don't have to be a Phytophthora to think like that. But so, thinking again this, this concept that the environment, if you live in the water, you will be more affected by temperature. So perhaps we can put in this kind of pathogens, we can put a hierarchy of first it comes water or precipitation, there would come temperature. And those would be sort of the organization of the climatic constraints. Why is this important? You will think, okay, is this matter? It is because there's a lot of interest in understanding how the diversity of microbes is around the world. And well, the, no one really had mentioned this. Uh, we look at the microbes as, as uh, big uh, things and we haven't really thought much perhaps as that they are often inside the host, inside the soil, inside the leaf, or you know, they are often covered or they live inside other things. They are not like free living animals or uh, organisms, sorry. Okay, so yeah, perhaps we can contribute a bit to that. Thinking about aquatic and terrestrial, we said, okay, maybe there's some functionality here that we can, it can help us also to understand the distribution. And actually this came out because uh, these functional traits, I always thought like, no, we can do functional traits with microbes. This is, but, but then I, I was in a tribunal of a, of a woman, she was defending a thesis in Sweden about lichens, and they were working with functional traits. And I, I thought, well, if the lichen people can do it, then I think we can do it too. So this is, it was a, a practice. So anyway, so yeah, but really to me, my question was like, can you really see any, any trait? They all look white and this, they are really not very funny at this level, these, these phytophthoras. But actually, uh, I must say that the phytophthora community, they are very thorough people and everybody, whenever they describe a new species, they do lots of, um, yeah description and they seem to be the same. So we have lots about uh, information about each species, whether it has like, for example, this kind of resistance structures that they are adapted to a bit harsh conditions. And also it's very often that you grow your phytophthora and a petri dish at different temperatures and you define what is the optimum temperature. So these are traits that can be quite, this quite standardized way. And you also have like a specialization thing. We know some phytophthora attack many hosts and some are very specialized. So, well, it's not an impressive list of traits, but well, it is what it is. So with that in mind, we said, okay, let's see if there is a pattern. And actually it was. We, we first, uh, the first thing we did was to put, try to put the plot in a gradient and we did this climatic score in which we took plots here that were warm and moist and here that they were cold and dry. And we could see that the areas where they're cold and dry, the communities were dominated by species having resistance structures. While here, in the warm, the communities were dominated by species not having them. So it looked like uh, having or not having allows you to predict where it will be most likely growing. And actually this turned out to be quite good because when looking at the other study that I mentioned that we were comparing nurseries and forests, we also saw that in nurseries, so whatever uh, if a species they come to Sweden, those species would have on average a little bit above 50% of them would have structures, but when we go to the forest, more than 80% of them have structures. So it looks like the same trait that is important to survive this introduction event is also important to, to spread within the, the country. Okay, this is quite useful if you think on quarantine rules. Is this species has structures or not? Then you can define more or less quite how likely will be this species to establish in a new area. We saw the same for growth temperature, so this was a good uh, pattern as well. And also for uh, infected tissues. We know some species that only occur in the roots, they are specialized in roots, some others specialized in foliage, and some other on the stem. And we could see all more or less the same pattern here. So species that are in the roots tend to be in cold and dry areas, where species that attack the leaves, they are more in more warm and moist areas, which would make sense if you think that, the, again, this environment matters in, in, in which uh, in, in understanding what are the constraints for these microbes. 
What we saw in the communities, we thought, okay, maybe this is also something that we can look at single species. If we look at the, at the communities, they are typically like that. You have a dominant species and then you have a less frequent species. So we say, can we predict this species distribution? Actually, we can. If you look at the sort of um, where on average that species occurs in the country, this is a bit what we saw with the older Phytophthora, it's quite a good correlation between the optimum temperature and where it occurs. So the actual growth temper of a single species would determine uh, the likelihood to find it in the different areas. We wanted to complicate it a bit more. As Miguel Angel is a very smart uh, person and he really wanted to prove the things right and uh, I was very happy with that. And he found this uh, paper, La Mana, where they, because we were struggling a lot with this concept of environmental filtering and competitive exclusion. And so is there a way to prove that? And well, these uh, people, they, 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 what they put here for was this theory, like, okay, if we have, uh, for example, for a certain given richness of species, we have, and uh, this is a hyper volume of traits, we have a lower diversity of traits than expected by random, perhaps there's a filtering, or if you have a higher, like uh, you're above this uh, brown, um, diversity of traits that would be expected by random, then you would have competitive exclusion. Because it would mean that one new species would come to the community, it would bring like new traits. It, doesn't, it cannot have the same traits as the ones they were there before. So, okay, it's a quite attractive concept. And Mingana, he said, okay, I think we can do that with our computer. I said, yeah, sure, try. And he actually managed. It was, uh, so again, we saw the same. So a bit the, this terrestrial aquatic difference. What we saw was that we did this uh, prediction and we could see that uh, uh, a difference between these two communities. We could see the terrestrial communities, 20% of the plots we measured, the functional richness was below what was expected for the, the given richness, giving signs that there was some environmental filtering in this number of plots, while this uh, same analysis done in the aquatic communities was much infrequent. Again, showing that a bit the same thing I mentioned before. Perhaps being in the land is a much more uh, travel uh, environment for these uh, microbes than being in the water. So, a bit going around the same uh, concept. But so, in water, they are more protected than in, in, in the land. Actually, I, again, I remind you, this, this is a, a pathogen that they are related to algae. So, it's a bit. Again, this is, uh, so why is this important? I just wanted to uh, zoom out a bit from Phytophthora. Um, uh, I mentioned it already before. If we know traits, we can inform and we can help um, European Union to define what are the commodity risks and the likelihood of giving an, Im an invasion. And why is this important? Because if, if we look at this, there was a research we did and with a questionnaire across Europe and and you will not see it very well, but if you ask them what are these measures that should be taken again, uh, invasive pathogens, they would, people would be much more happy in using more stringent standards for, uh, for plant production rather than reducing the import. Okay, you can argue that the questioner was, but it gives an indication that perhaps we should work more on that rather than on banning for specific uh, pathways. So there's, uh, these traits can give informative for increasing our capacity to produce healthier plants. And uh, now, uh, okay, these were traded very important for Sweden, but uh, I think it's also, uh, I'm, we are continuing now with this research and we are trying to see whether the same traits, which I doubt they will be the same, but other traits can be also informative in other areas. So we have started now this research in Catalonia and we've put all these plots and we will sort of replicate a bit what we did in Sweden. So we will look at the communities and we will look at which traits are structuring them. There is a lot of interest in the, in here in, in the authorities. They also see how, especially in the field of agriculture, there's a lot of new diseases coming and also in the field of forestry. So they want proof and they want to be informed on what are the yeah, what are the things? The first thing I told them, what you need to know is what you have here already to know what is coming. New. But anyway, with this we will resolve and there are many things we can compare with this setup. For example, we know that around this area there's a lot of introduction because there's a lot of exotic plantation forestry, while in this area it's more like a natural management. So we will get at least an initial picture of what we have here. If you want to follow me, you can add me on Twitter and I will keep you updated of, of all these things. 
Anyway, so that uh, this is uh, until now the talk was about things that happened before invasion, but unfortunately, uh, many things get through. And here, uh, uh, the the question is like, what to do? What do we do when we have an invasion? And I think a lot of people, that, with the first thing they do is like, le uh, let's start breeding for resistance. Let's try to find uh, resistant varieties. And here, I would, I just wanted to add uh, another research we did uh, to be a bit controversial, perhaps, and we can discuss it. But I think it's a complex situation to when you get an invader, because at the end, if you start breeding for resistant varieties and trees, someone will have to plant them. And and so uh, this is sort of uh, to me a bit of a, uh, that's why I think a lot of these European projects also they want in stakeholders in the project because really you have, we have to develop things that at the end someone is going to apply. Why am I telling that? Because look at what happened in this, uh, this is a chestnut, uh, you know, well in Catalonia it has this invasive pathogen which is chestnut blight and this is the only invasive pathogen that has an actual control measure. You can spread it with some virus, let's put it that way, and you know, you can control it. What has happened is a lot of the old chestnut owners in Catalonia, they have to change. They have cut down the chestnut and they have put uh, exotic plantations and they have simply abandoned the forest. So why is that? If there's a solution, is there's a solution that we are trying to find in other projects, why do, do they do it? Well, that's what we see, we try to find out in this research, uh, we did some interviews and actually what turned out Unfortunately, or well, that's the reality. I think a lot of the management of the or the the will to control was associated with getting a, a return of the of the treatment that you were applying. Most of the people were willing to uh, treat their chestnut stands is because they were producing chestnut for fruit, which is very valuable crop. The ones that were producing for timber, they were rather if they were interested in getting some return, they would rather substitute it with exotic plantations, or they would just abandon the forest. So, anyway, I think there's a we have to really think well before uh, starting doing things after an invasion. But perhaps also these thoughts can also be. It would be also good to know whether there's some chances for the natural populations to adapt to these invasions. Can we know if there's a species that will adapt or not? If it will, maybe this is not so priority and we can work on the ones that will not and will not have a monetary return and perhaps are important for ecosystem services. So this is what we tried to do in this research. And we did it by looking at the, um, what was left of an after an invasion. We work on, on Phytophthora alni again, the first system that I told you, and on alders, which is uh, uh, quite an important tree. And the reason we wanted to know is that is will alder adapt to this invader? And actually, when we're looking at the, these places where we're taking the water, it was often talking to the fishermen and the water. There was such a beautiful forest here, but now they better actually because it was more clean, they got this nice grass now. No, but so the, the, what was clear it was that there was areas that the disease has struck very hard, so it could kill some trees, but there were some trees there. Is this, uh, are these like sprouts or hope, or is just uh, something that by, hap by chance it sort of uh, survived the, the disease? So here there are two possibilities. Either those are genetically resistant, or they have escaped. And now you will think, what, what, how can you escape this? But, so I think this is uh, something that we wanted to explore in this, this type of research, is, is giving more uh, epidemiological aspect to an invasion. Can you escape an, invasion, an invader? And actually you can. If you think uh, about these two species that I mentioned before, you have one that is very pathogenic and one that is not so pathogenic. <coughs> And actually, if you want to, this is a typical question for the forest pathology. What is the best uh, pathogen? How you can design the best pathogen? The best pathogen is the virus that, uh, or is it a virus that uh, creates the zombies? So that's the best pathogen. It's a, it's a pathogen that can create infectious individuals that will be infectious for a very long time. So the zombies can walk around until they have legs, you know, this. I haven't seen the series, but maybe some of you. Have. So this is the, this is, and, so if you kill your host too fast, that's the concept I want to tell you. If you kill it too fast, then you will sort of uh, die off soon. So then you can kill three trees, but then the, you will kill them too fast so you cannot grow on them and kill another one, right? So that was the two things we wanted to say. So are they escapers? So if, when we go to this situation, are these guys just escaping here? 
they went under the radar or they are really truly resistant. So what we did was to design an experiment. We went, uh, f f this uh, mm, uh, disease is quite good because you can find alders in the forest and in the river. So you can find alders that are in contact with Inverda and not in contact. So we took seeds from these two areas, from areas that were infected with Phytophthora uniformis, the one that is with the zombie type of uh, disease, and the Phytophthora alni, which will be the super killer one, right? So we could compare these two. We were taking seeds of them to, to get a bit the genetic signal. We were growing in the same conditions and we were inoculating them. What we saw was that there was a higher survival of uh, Phytophthora uniformis on invaded sites. Okay, that was quite of a good news. If you see, if we take seeds from trees that they are in the river of the survivors, they are a little bit more resistant than the naive population in the forest that has never seen a pathogen. One could think, okay, this is uh, good, that would support our hypothesis that those are uh, genetically resistant and there will be some uh, selective pressure there. What happened in Phytophthora alni, we could see none of that. The ones in the river that were theoretically surviving were equally susceptible to the ones in the forest, so they had, were really in principle no signs of selection there. To further uh, support uh, that there perhaps was a selection, we could see actually uh, the, in case of uniformis, where we have seen a, uh, uh, a gain of resistance, we could see a loss of, uh, of heritability. And now you will tell me, what is another term? Yes, what is heritability? So heritability is the percentage of your uh, variation, for the variation is explained by the genotype. And this is, what does it mean basically? Imagine you have different families, so if the variation within the family is very big and between the families is very small, that would be basically a trait that is in, under very, very little genetic control. If in, in then the other way around, you have families that they are very different between them, there will be a big genetic control. What is this important for? Basically, uh, Fisher, which was one of the one of starting with this uh, evolution, he said and he proposed, and then it was later confirmed that treat, traits related to feedmas have a lower heritability because they have a very strict genetic control. There's only one way to be in this environment. You cannot have, uh, you know, feathers yellow and, you know, these kind of non-adaptive traits. They are not good to be so variable. So you need to have it this way. It's quite... Well, one could think that perhaps these populations that were naive, they have never seen the pathogen. Some of them, by chance, they were um, resistant to the pathogen and some were susceptible, but since they have never seen the pathogen, it doesn't matter. There was not selection, the traits were sort of kept in the population. When the pathogen came, those that were uh, susceptible were removed and the heritability decreased. So all this is just to tell you that there's a little bit of support that there's a selection in this, in this, in this trait. There was no selection in Alni, but as you can see, the original heritability of this trait was very low, so there was really no no resistance on the, on, the, on the population. But one could ask, so what, why there was here, uh, why was this like that and not like, and he didn't go down, so there was some sort of uh, an improvement here. What we did was like to try this epidemiological system. Perhaps uh, the problem is that this one kills the trees too fast, and this one allows to, you know, sort of to the infected trees to kill other susceptible trees and to the, the epidemic to go on. And this is too fast, so all of them are escapers. What we did was to swap the, the epidemiological parameters. So we took, we converted uh, only into uniformis and the other way around by keeping the same heritability. And we could see that this didn't make any difference. So actually, what? The only thing that was uh, giving a gain in, in resistance was actually having a genetic background in the native population. What is this all about? Uh, what is the implication of that? If we want to start breeding for resistance in something, we have to know if this will naturally adapt. And this, I think, is a very good uh, trait to study and to predict. And also to invest our resources in the ones that will very unlikely, like the red one, do it by themselves. There we can really start bringing in new, new resistance. I finish here now. So we managed to uh, define what were invasive species in Sweden. 
this is important you go to a place you have many phytophthora species which are invasive this is as i showed you it's not so easy to define but perhaps this uh, framework of invasion can be helpful for that we know we could sort of show at least not discard that human activities were linked to this invasion by reconstructing this process we, ho we saw that climate is important, at least in northern uh, locations, and that with this climate it seems to be a lot of functional traits associated. And then we could see that uh, if we wanted to predict whether a host will adapt or not, heritability can be a good predictor for that. Thank you so much. Yes, it is a little bit. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Actually, it, uh, they are uh, in uh, in inoculation trials. They are a little bit more uh, susceptible. They, well, they are more they are more, they are the more pathogenic. But here, I think the the way we used uh, our inoculation system, it was too hard for the plant anyway. So we could not replicate what was in nature here. But we know from literature that one is more pathogenic than the other. Uh, related to that question, I, I, I was very happy to see this last experiment because I suspect that the, well, or I, I wonder whether the, the pathogenic impact or the also the likelihood to become invasive, I suppose it's very much related also to the host species, no, as you, you show also. So I would like to know how you see that and, and what the implications are. So it, it, thinking about practical legislation, or is it enough finding some traits that are characteristic of some specific uh, well, sort of pathogenicity, or we really need to define these traits in relation to the environment where this specific species or set of species is likely to, to enter? Or in other words, for example, is it, is it really a species attribute, the pathogenicity, uh, an attribute of the host or of the, pa uh, of, the of the pathogen. Is it is it always? I mean, is it something you can attribute to the species, or would depend on the environment? I suppose it should depend on the environment of the host. And um, yes, it uh, yeah, it depends on the environment. I, I think so. There's a in order to 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 kill a plant, you need to recognize it as a host, and this is uh, something that has a phylogenetic signal. So, you if you are a pathogen of one oak, you will be likely to be a pathogen of a fagus or similar, and and this has been shown. So, yes, there is a signal that can be predicted across species, but of course, the environment matters as well. Uh, it matters di directly to the pathogen because you need to survive cer certain temperatures. Mm -hmm. And also it, need, it matters because you need to compete with other pathogens. So perhaps other pathogens are more adapted to those conditions than you. So, and perhaps they are not pathogens, but they are occupying your niche inside the, the, this tissue. And also it's important the environment because it might affect the host and making it more susceptible. Or and susceptibility doesn't mean that it, it will be more uh, stressed, but uh, it might make them, for example, it grows better and it has more elongated shoots and more tender, you know. I think it can be bad both ways, for example. One of the clear examples is uh, Pinus radiata, which if you go to the original um, environment, it's not a very big pine, but it's planted all over as a fantastic uh, growing species. And that is very susceptible to many pathogens, but not in the original. So you, you have, yeah, but pathogenity is an interaction. So uh, it's interacting with the host and the environment. I think that these results show this also very nicely. I mean, the fact that in this particular experiment, even if you know that the two species are different, they show similar. Exactly. And I mean, the implications in, in terms of defining this criteria, I mean, legal criteria to, for trade or whatever are quite important as well. Yes. This would be more, I think, uh, to, to define, I think, for example, I will give you a practical example. Now uh, is ice dieback, it's a, a, a scomycet that is killing a lot of the ices. And 
So should we try to breed for resistance for this uh, tree? Ice is very nice, it's, uh, people plant it around the fields, but the problem is that they know, we know that from a rice is coming emerald ice border, which is another invasive pest. So do we start a breeding program on one, one and uh, but then it will come the other one. So there's a lot of these new pathogens coming and, and these can be helpful a little bit to to see, okay, is, if you have a good genetic background that you will receive, perhaps the first wave will kill a lot of the individuals, but perhaps it will be a recovery. But maybe you don't have no resistance, then you really should start doing something. Maybe you have to bring, well, this is very controversial, but you could bring from genes from another species and these kind of things. But, yeah, it's a bit to anticipate the future. Here we know, so basically, what we want to predict is this, right? So or uh, if this will go worse or it will go better before it happens. This is Paul. I have two questions. One is just that uh, it's just, uh, there is some reports on mortality of fauna in Burkina Faso and Ethiopia. Yes. It is related to to Phytophthora? I I don't know. I, no one has lo uh, has looked at it. I think but properly. But did you know about this this mortality? I have seen it myself, but uh, I, I haven't really had the time. I know. And but it's quite a hard pathogen to find, actually. So it's really not so easy to isolate or to see the symptoms. And the second question is more, you know, general ecological theory. Touching one of the words you say in, the, in your answer is about the competition between the pathogens. Yes. Uh, does it really exist? What, what I mean is, uh, I'm not sure because I, I don't know no, the no. system, but if you have the words and it's supposed to be the different pathogens are competing, that means that they are, they are eventually the, the words are full of the pathogens because if there is many words that are not infected, probably they the competition between them is not so far because they, are, they have a lot of resources. Mm -hmm. So my question is, uh, is really uh, tested, can, can be really tested competition in the in mechanistic sense between pathogens or is just, you know, this general concept that you ha we have, okay, if they are sharing the same species, they are competing, but in fact, they need to compete by the resources, by the piece of fruit, uh, which is your experience, you know? Yeah, um, do, do you understand my I understand your question. I think it's, uh, yeah, can you test it? Uh, yeah, I think you, you could test it, but I think that it's more of a, perhaps it's more of a general assumption that is like that, yeah. right? Uh, and, and because there are many in the roots, but also what happened is that if you have um, uh, pathogens that they are not so good at killing you, then you are also a bit activated. So, you know, you... The roots are uh, sort of, are, there's this um, priming in plant. So if you attack a plant and then this plant will be more likely to react. So if you have a soft infection on the roots then you will be more likely to react against another pathogen. Okay, so maybe it's not a direct competition, but it's this kind of... You, it can be direct, it can be direct. It can, uh, in fact, one of the, for example, one of the... Um, Ways of controlling one of the big pathogens, which is heterobasidion, which I haven't talked here, is uh, to play with this competition. So basically, this is a pathogen that attacks trees when you cut them, and then you cut the, the tree, and then this big stem is sort of uncolonized. And there, there the pathogen has a big opportunity. Because it, it grows there, and it goes down to the roots, and then it colonizes the neighboring tree. But this is something that would, wouldn't really happen in nature, that you cut a tree. It would be more like a wound, for example. And there, you would already have pathogens, and heterobacidin is not so good at colonizing wounds. So, in a way, that would be the situation you're saying, where there's a lot of competition, and that would be the natural, competi the natural situation. But because we cut trees with a chainsaw, we are open this big wound, and there, by chance, heterobacidin is very good. So how do we control it? We control it by putting another fungus that colonizes the space. We put Flaviopsis gigantea, which is not a pathogen, but is a very good saprotroph, and we, it colonizes the space of the stem, and then sort of the pathogen, even spores will arrive, they are too small to start competing, because the space is occupied. Yeah, but, but, but the is, is really interesting, because many times we, we assume that the antagonistic relationship is classical competition by resources, but when we are, because I'm plant ecologist, but if you move to the world of the of micro, 
are that's different because there is a there is a reaction of the host that is the immunitary or the defense um, response that can produce a negative effect on the other pathogen, also they are not interacting directly. Exactly. And we, we can assume that this this, this they are competing, but in fact it's not competition in this classical way. It's an antagonistic mediated by the, the host. Of the host. This is really interesting. Yes, yes, exactly. It can be it's, it's the way like many infections of uh, microbes and even spore when you have an immunitary system you can do. Exactly. But but think about that, it's like a, there's a lot of some of these uh, fungus is also a matter of space, you know, they get sort of deadlocked inside because they, they, they come with spores. Mm -hmm. And also, um, I must say that uh, a lot of them, they are endophytically inside the, the, the trees. For example, in the needles, a lot of the fungus in the needles, they come there endophytically. So when they f this needle falls into the floor, they are the first ones there already. So it's very hard for the saprophytes of the soil to colonize that uh, pine needle because they are already so this priority effect. So and also you have uh, you also have succession on the they have seen they have succession on the on the saprotroph. So there are fungus that grow better on substrate that has been pre degraded by another fungus. So it's it's like a small world uh, which yeah, it's, <laughs> <laughs> but it's the same as in the big one. More questions. I have one question. They, are there uh, rankings of the degree of susceptibility or uh, resistance of the different tree species in the region and to these uh, invaders, to these species? No, like you mean like the same pathogen inoculated two very different hosts and to yeah, see. And the response of these different trees in, a, in the region, for example, in Sweden, they are not too many species then. Be possible to they have done some things like that in, in Phytophthora, they are, they are working on that. Um, but it, as you say, and in Sweden it's may, maybe easy because they are, don't have so many species, but here it would be very hard. And also it's a bit hard to standardize the, um, the lesions also. Where, you know, when you compare, okay, this is a lesion, but if you compare between a pine and a oak, for example, yeah. Or a leaf, for example, a needle or a oak leaf. It's you know this comparison. But um, th there's this group in, in California that they work with this phylogenetic signal, and they actually managed to sort of standardize a, a system to inocu inoculate uh, many many species with the same uh, fungus, yeah, yeah. and and you know and compare you know this this kind of. But uh, it's it's difficult. In other words. Have this question in a well, same question in a maybe broader uh, sense. I mean, are there traits of the hosts that would relate to susceptibility in general to pathogens, not to doctor in particular? Of course, it will depend. But is there any general trait that makes trees or plants mm -hmm. more susceptible that you know? But you mean like microscopic traits? Yes. I don't know, but uh, I haven't heard about that. But I haven't heard about that. But I think, um, yes, but that would be interesting, but perhaps one should also think there on that you have this indirect effect. So perhaps if having one trait makes you less stressed by the environment and then you, therefore you are less. So, but a lot of the pathology is worked on um, this uh, recognition at cellular level, you know, is this either I recognize you and you recognize me so I can respond or not. And Unfortunately, maybe, <laughs> but it's working at different scales, you know, this is what... Uh, no, 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 <laughs> no, <laughs> no, but I, think, but I think perhaps it should be explored, I, th I think this... this, this is what if, I mean, of course, not by, as you know, I work with drought, what, what are we looking for? Traits that explain resistance to drought, or the same applies to any other stress factor, and you could think of pathogens like another stress factor. But yet, the, the way we, we study the interaction is very different. In fact, it's much, much more, I mean, in many ways, much more detailed and deep the way you study the interaction. With. Yeah, but for example, some pathogens have, uh, pro um, uh, I know this tylosis, for example, there is this reaction to the basalt. Some uh, trees that have these big uh, basalt, they are more susceptible to that than, uh, but um, yeah, uh, here with an interaction with another organism, I think we should then think, yeah, more right, because then uh, I'm not so sure that is the adaptation to the pathogen, you know what I mean. 
Maybe it's indirectly more resistant to that pathogen, but it's not really the true mechanism of resistance. Yeah, or it's mediated by the drought in that case. But yeah, I, I think you, you have these big databases. You, you should uh, try to, to, to do it, Jordi. Maybe there's a signal there. Yeah, I think that, that's a very good. No, no, I think that's a very good question. I think maybe if Miguel Angel is listening to me through the web, I don't know. But we we want to work on that actually because we 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 have quite a good system that we can produce other with a lot of these nodules or without them and. Uh, and we were thinking in, in testing whether these also mediate some susceptibility to, to phytophthora. Because in fact, one of the things you Paco mentioned is that uh, perhaps there's, uh, the susceptibility to these is because they put a lot of nitrogen in the fields and then the rivers they have a little bit, and then the alnus is losing a lot of these symbionts and the roots are more susceptible to phytophthora. So you could have this indirect effect there. It would be interesting to do that in Catalonia because you, you have a lot of points different places where and there is uh, some some uh, expertise on measuring biochemistry in the forest and so on and we, we definitely want to, I'm, I'm trying to, yeah, to convince Miguel Angel to do that and I think we will do it because uh, I believe it's a bit mediated. I mean if you look at the nodules on the roots, I mean that must have some effect. I mean, uh, for example, these phytophthoras, they don't colonize the whole root, so they really go into a, speci a specific part. It's a little bit behind the apex. That is where they are good to infect. So, and if you see at the root with all these nodules, they are a little bit deformed, so maybe there's some if, sort of physical or uh, ch morphological change that affects the infection, but also perhaps you have this uh, priming that I was measuring. You have uh, some infection in the root by this bacteria and that is mediating a faster response to the pathogen. Or perhaps they are more rich in nitrogen and they can, can you know, have better resources to produce some uh, amino acid from the fence metabolite and then they, they can kill faster the pathogen. So, yeah, it, it's a really interesting point. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And a lot of this is, for example, these trees are close by to a field actually. So, and this, there's a cows here. So, for sure, a really big nitrogen input. But I have, we haven't checked when, how well are the nodules in these ones. So, so but it, it's a good. Uh, I think it's a very interesting angle to work with. More questions? If not, I forgot to say that, as always, we will have a dinner with uh, Jonas tonight. So if someone wants to join, just tell me. Um, I still don't know where it's going to be, but uh, somewhere probably in Brazil. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 I can't believe it. <laughs> um, yeah, so if, if someone wants to join, then we will soon. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.